So for your pathogen sheet, the name of the disease is Coronavirus Disease 2019 or COVID-19. That's what most people use, COVID-19. That's the name of the disease. The virus that causes the disease is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. So the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. The name of the disease that it produces is COVID-19. The first case was in December 1, uh, 2019. Therefore, COVID-19, that's uh, the year that it was first discovered. And um, here's some more information for you. Um, the incubation period for this virus is anywhere between 1 to 14 days. So people will have uh, start symptoms uh, anywhere between 2 to 14 days after exposure to the virus. Um, people with um, the symptoms um, for COVID-19, they usually have a cough, shortness of breath. That seems to be a com very common theme to the point where people were really afraid that they, can't, they just can't breathe. Uh, difficulty breathing, uh, fever, high fever a lot of times, chills, muscle pain, sore throat, and then new loss of taste or smell, that seems to be also a common theme. Uh, lately, there has been an emerging disease among children uh, that were exposed or had COVID-19, and they end up with a cytokine storm, which is caused by an overreaction of the immune system that then causes a severe inflammatory kind of um, illness. The mode of transmission is human to human via respiratory droplets and then also fomites, of course, uh, door handles, um, anything that is commonly touched, maybe a touchpad for, I don't know, a credit card at a bank or uh, stuff that a lot of people touch, uh, that would all be counting as a po potential way to uh, get the coronavirus. Um, so here's some more information about COVID-19. It is a beta coronavirus. This is what it looks like. It's kind of a pretty looking virus. Corona, of course, comes from sort of the Latin word crown and has this crown surrounding its surface. If you can see that, it's this crown here. And there, it's um, an enveloped virus, spherical, so round three-dimensional, about 120 nanometers in diameter. The RNA genome is associated with the N protein to form uh, the nucleocapsid. And here's the COVID-19 genome, if you're interested. Uh, the one thing I would like to point out is that uh, the part that's different from SARS-2003, uh, the 2003 SARS virus, uh, that's a very small portion, just only this portion in red, everything else is identical. Um, COVID-19 has a linear single-stranded RNA genome and its RNA plus strands or sense strand genome of about 27 to 32 kilobases and that makes it a very large RNA virus. It's a very large RNA virus genome. The viral replication steps are listed right here. So it follows the typical pattern of attachment to the host cell and then it will enter the host cell or fusion of the virus membrane with the endosomal membrane. It will then employ the host cell uh, to become a viral factory to produce more viral particles or viral parts that then have to be assembled. So you need to first do the transcription and replication of the parts of the um, of the virus. Then you need to assemble the viral particles and then eventually the bud, the uh, virus will bud off of the host cells. And um, the uh, release of the new viral particles is by exocytosis. Uh, a little bit here on host cells and the cell interactions. So the reservoirs for SARS-CoV is bats. Uh, the reservoir for MERS for the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, that was um, camels included and then also bats. Uh, the primary site of infection would be epithelial cells of the respiratory or enteric tracts uh, or neurological tissues. Uh, that um, can be the case, but for the most part, it would be the respiratory tract that's infected. 
Um, there's also a bovine version of the coronavirus that causes gastrointestinal problems. Uh, one thing to, that's interesting to point out is the cell receptors where the virus can bind to, and that includes the ACE2 receptor. Now, ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. And that enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which then leads to blood vessel diameter reduction and the release of aldosterone, um, which both will cause an increase in blood pressure. That's how it's all designed. But ACE2 is mostly expressed in lung tissue, and the virus, the COVID-19, um, the virus binding to the ACE2 receptor, that's how it gains entry into your respiratory epithelium and then infects your lungs. And next up, a little bit more on the COVID-19 ecology. So the geography, of course, worldwide associated diseases, um, mostly respiratory, anything, uh, pneumonia, worst case scenario, and then um, gastroenteritis. So people that have severe disease, they need to be in ventilators, as you know, and so that would be the severe acute respiratory syndrome. So SARS-CoV-1, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Then we have SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus, which causes pneumonia in a lot of people, and the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, the MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, that one also caused pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So the transmission, um, unfortunately, um, COVID-19 is uh, easily transmitted from person to person. It is also a zoonosis, that means it can be transmitted between animals and humans, which is rare normally for viruses, but coronaviruses are pretty notorious for being able to do that. And then respiratory droplets, uh, such as sneezing, coughing, and then fomites, uh, that would be inanimate objects that somebody else touched or sneezed on, and then you touch it, and then you have your the virus on your hands, and you touch your face with your hands, and then you have it in your portals of entry, like the eyes or the nose or your mouth. Um, so again, here the SARS-CoV, and MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus, that's the one that we're dealing with right now. Uh, the transmission is mostly respiratory droplets and then fomites. Question, good question is where are we now? Um, so the May 20, 2020 update. May 20, 2020 update. Um, worldwide, uh, we are having right now about um, 5,090,000 um, cases. So almost 5.1 million cases worldwide. Currently, there are... 329,757 deaths from coronavirus. Active cases, about 2.735 million. Close cases, 2.355 million. That adds up to the total case number right here. And um, out of those people that had an outcome, 86% uh, recovered, so that amounts to two point, a little over 2 million people, and 14% uh, died. Uh, that's the 329,757 that we had up here. In the United States, um, we're not doing too good. Um, we have currently 1,592,723 total cases, and tomorrow that number will be higher. Um, 22,140 new cases just today. That was May 20, 2020. Um, we have a total number of almost 95,000 deaths, which will reach the 100,000 marks mark in a few days. And just today, 1,403 new deaths. Now, with numbers that high uh, and and death tolls on uh, that large, everybody, of course, is looking for a treatment. Uh, especially because everybody is really would like to get back to some sort of our normality in their lives. Uh, what we really need is an effective treatment and please a vaccine as soon as possible. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, I don't expect any vaccine to be a, a ready for um, mass manufacture and mass use um, before the beginning of next year. If we're really, really lucky, we might be able to get one by the end, really the end of this year. 
but more likely it will be the beginning of 2021. Uh, there are several antiviral drugs that are currently in clinical trials. Uh, they include uh, several antiviral components such as remdesivir, which is a viral polymerase inhibitor. And then there are some other um, antiviral drugs that are, might be, might prove useful, such as a fusion inhibitor or retrovirus protease inhibitors um, that are used for HIV treatment. Now, the famous hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malaria drug and was temporarily approved because the president was promoting it very much, it turns out it is not effective. And so do not take hydroxychloroquine to uh, treat any kind of coronavirus infection. It, it, in fact, has proven that it's more dangerous than it could be potentially useful. And um, another thing that you should not do is uh, disinfect yourself with uh, bleach or other things that are disinfectants. The, um, those kind of things, if anything, hand sanitizer should be only used externally. So no cleansing with um, um, kind of disinfectants as has been suggested um, out of the White House. Um, now moving on to influenza viruses. And uh, here we have a um, group of viruses that cause what's known as the flu. These are single-stranded RNA viruses with envelope. They are retroviruses and they have the H and the N antigens. So these spike proteins, they are the hemagglutinin spike and the neuraminid neuraminidase uh, spikes. They are these are the H and the N antigens that change every year, and that's why you need to get a new flu shot every year. So um, the H and N uh, combinations of antigens, they change every year, and you need a new vaccine. Here will be uh, the flu viral particles in blue. They attach here to respiratory cilia. Most cases are in the winter months, somewhere between December and March. And an average year, you're going to have about... 110,000 hospitalizations and about 20,000 deaths from the flu. And here's another interesting interesting thing. The flu virus that they can hybridize. Sorry about my cat in the background. I think she's getting bored with my lecture. But anyway, so flu virus hybridization. Let's take a look at that. So here you have uh, virus 1 and virus 2. And they make a, vi a hybrid virus. In this case, uh, virus 1 came from a human. And this virus came from a pig. And then they can make a combination virus like this. Uh, here's another... Um, picture image showing flu virus hybridization. So here would be your human virus and has the uh, light purple spike proteins and here's the bird virus has the green kind of uh, spike proteins and the green DNA right there and here would be the recombined virus that contains part human and part ver bird virus DNA and uh, those kind of things they can be rather dangerous because of course they can be infecting then several species. Um, now here, um, let's take a look at the latest flu pandemics um, that have hit us for sort of within the last hundred years. Uh, the Spanish flu is um, was one that caused a lot of deaths. Um, it's estimated that it killed between 20 and 100 million people worldwide. And that was an H1N1 a combination of antigens or spike proteins on the surface. Um, also, the Asian flu pandemic of the H2N2 that killed over 1 million people worldwide from 19, 1957. Then there was the Hong Kong pandemic, an H3N2 combination that killed over half a million people worldwide. And then here we have the swine flu pandemic. That one you might remember. This was an H1N1 combination that killed uh, more than 280,000 people worldwide. So here's a diagram that shows some of the more deadly H and N combinations of spike proteins on these flu viruses. And here... Uh, you can see that H1N1 is pretty notorious for causing big problems. Uh, so the Spanish flu of 18, uh, 1918, I'm sorry, 
uh, Dawan killed millions of people and um, caused by H1N1. Another offender seems to be H2N2. So you can see that right here, H2N2. That's another big offender. And there are some other combinations, but every year you're going to have to get a new flu vaccine. And usually lately they've been doing quad vaccines where they have four different combinations of H and N spike proteins uh, to give you some immunity for what's coming.